Uh, hi. Uh, thank you, Michelle, for inviting me. Um, I forgot to bring a copy of my book, but it's right over there, right for Evolution on that table. You can take a look. Um, so I'm from Harvard Business School, and I'm here to talk about socialism, which is what you expect from Harvard Business School. Um, so socialism's gotten a lot more press in the last decade or so, right? It's become a lot more prominent in American political discourse since Bernie Sanders runs for the presidency, since the squad in Congress. Um, you're probably familiar with polling, for example, that shows that now a majority of people age 18 to 34 have a more positive view of socialism than capitalism in the United States. But the question always is, okay, but what do they mean by socialism? And if you ask four people, you'll probably get six or seven different answers. So that's where the conversation ends, right? Because nobody knows what socialism means. So what I argue is we actually, we, we need to understand what socialism means by having a history of socialism, right? It's, what socialism would mean in practice is not simply you know, what an individual might theoretically want, but this is you know, a path-dependent product of history. And we understand this is the case of capitalism. Right? History of capitalism is a rapidly growing field, very dynamic. There are conferences, there are journals, there are all numbers of job ads which talk about history of capitalism. And the central theme of history of capitalism is that the theory of capitalism and the practice of capitalism are different. In theory, capitalism is about efficient markets, price mechanisms, perfect information. In reality, right, as historians have told us, capitalism is often about violence and oppression and coercion and racism and imperialism. Lots of things that get in the way of sort of, you know, price mechanisms and efficient markets. Um, but we haven't gotten there with socialism yet because people still hold on to the idea that real socialism has never been tried, which is an important political position, but it is not a historical claim. Um, and so we need a history of socialism as such. And that's what my book tries to get at. Uh, so my book concentrates on what was called during the Cold War the Third World. And the reason for this is that, you know, we have histories of the Soviet Union or histories of China, which focus very much on the domestic mechanism, domestic politics there. Um, we have, to a certain degree, histories of the left and the West, but those never really held power. Um, and so the Third World is really where kind of the dynamic movement happens during the Cold War. Um, and this is where I argue the Third World becomes a laboratory, a development, you know, an area of development for socialism, a place where experiments can be run. Um, in which, you know, socialism evolves through a process of trial and error. It iterates over the course of the Cold War. And because it iterates, right, by the 1980s, 1990s, it's in a different place than it was in the 1940s. Um, and so this kind of iteration produces a socialism in the Cold War that is not what you might have thought of being in the Cold War. And to understand where socialism is today, you have to understand how it evolves, how it iterates in practice. So let me give you some examples of what this iteration might mean. Um, so, Examples from the book. Uh, so one question looking at the post-colonial world is, how do you build socialism in a country that has an agrarian economy? Right? There's no, very little industry. There's no working class. This is not what Marx envisioned. How do you build socialism in a country that has no working class and no factories to take over? Right? Very little in terms of means of production actually sees. So answer number one, early 1960s, West Africa. The Soviets tried, well, foreign aid. Right? We'll pour in foreign aid, we'll do you know, geological surveys, we'll build the metallurgical factories, we'll build the dams, the infrastructure, create a working class. Right? You can import industry, but you do it you know, through, from socialist countries owned by the state, and there you have state-led industrialization. Uh, this did not work very well for a number of reasons, one of them being that states began to worry about, you know, if you're president of a country and the Soviets are you know, in force, um, trying to build a working class, you might wonder if they plan to keep you around for that long. Um, so they get thrown out of places like Ghana and Mali. Um, so along comes President Nyerere in Tanzania and says, well, if foreign aid didn't work, self-reliance. Let's do it like this. We'll communalize our own agriculture. We'll use that to build an agricultural surplus. We'll sell the surplus abroad, use the money to industrialize, you know, sort of bootstrap our way to socialism through, you know, communalization. It turns out that's a very difficult and slow process. And if you don't have, you know, um, tractors and you can't afford them to begin with, you're not going to produce enough of a surplus to make this work. So you're sort of caught, you know, catch-22. How do you industrialize if you don't have industry already in order to produce the surplus? So what the Soviets do when that fails in Tanzania is they go to Angola in the late 1970s and say, you know what? Don't communalize your agriculture. And, you know, le in, in, how about you keep foreign direct investment? Um, and so they say, you know, we're not going to fund it and you can't fund it by yourself. Let's have Western private companies fund the development that will lead to socialism. And so by the 1980s, you have Cuban guerrillas defending Gulf oil installations in Angola from American armed United guerrillas, right? That's what you end up with, all in the name of building socialism in Angola. And so markets become incorporated into socialism. Another example, right? In theory, Marx says that religion is the opiate of the masses. 
So how do you deal with, you know, the politics of a country where religion plays an important part? where people are devoutly religious, where they saw religion as a form of oppression, you know, Christians trying to oppress Muslims in colonialism, um, and where, you know, imams still hold a lot of political power. So in Indonesia, they say, well, we'll try to enlighten, you know, the peasantry. Um, that didn't work very well. That ends up with the massacre of the Indonesian Communist Party. So they iterate, they, you know, reevaluate the role of religion, and then comes, you know, Iran in 1979, and the Soviet Union actually instructs the Iranian communists to support Ayatollah Khomeini coming to power and the idea that, no, he's a fellow revolutionary. This is also an anti-imperialist, anti-Western revolutionary. And so they helped Khomeini take power in 1979. Um, there's a lot more. If you want to know the details, read my book. Uh, there's a lot more about this in there. But this is, you know, iterative process. At the end of the Cold War, you end up with a socialism that, number one, for example, embraces the notion of markets, that markets have a role in a socialist economy as long as they're under state, you know, control. Um, but you're no longer looking at a centrally planned Stalinist-style economy. We've evolved away from that. Um, notions of identity, right, have moved beyond class. So people understand, you know, that oppression can also be framed in terms of race or ethnicity or gender or religion, and these are meaningful narratives as far as, you know, what a socialism might look like um, in the 21st century. Uh, so this is the, these are the kinds of ways in which socialism iterates, it evolves. And so we think about what it means today, right, it has to be a product of the kinds of practices that socialism has, you know, both uh, adopted and, um, you know, rejected in the past. Uh, so I will cede my last 20 seconds to the chair. Thank you very much.